Greetings, folks. And if you found yourself circling around the same drain of vintage computer news I have, then you've likely seen these things pop up in one social media feed or another. Yeah, these weird AliExpress retro PCs known as the Book 8088 and the Hand 386. Built in low quantities by a guy in China and briefly made available for purchase to anyone with more curiosity than sense. Or with a YouTube channel. I think half of these were snapped up by jerks like me within a day, and they've been sold out ever since at the time of recording. And in hindsight, I kind of wish I hadn't bothered, since I truly don't like covering new devices that people no longer have the option to grab themselves. However, after a few weeks shipping, I have both the Book 8088 and the Hand 386, so we may as well take a closer look. Who knows, maybe they'll come back in stock. And we'll begin with the question of just what the balls are these? While they're not emulation boxes, you won't find a Raspberry Pi or a lone FPGA controlling everything inside. These are DOS PCs running an 8088 and 386SX processor, respectively. Each system uses legacy chips on custom PCBs inside, melded with various open source projects, off-the-shelf components, and injection molded enclosures. In other words, the Book 8088 and Hand 386 combine just about every homebrew project in the enthusiast retro computing hobby over the past several years, smushed into attractive little palm top slash handheld cases. Well, somewhat attractive. Those decals are distractingly bad, and I can't force myself to look at them a moment longer. Mmm, that's better. Anyway, yeah, the components powering these computers are nothing new, but the form factors are unusual for hardware of this vintage, basically taking this and this and shrinking them down into this and this. Naturally, this comes at a price, which at the time I bought them was 1399 Chinese yuan each, or roughly $196 US a piece. So for the 8088, that included the computer itself, a little red power button, and a 12-volt power adapter. Along with a breakout ISA extender, more on that in a bit. And this soundboard, a neat little thing containing the Yamaha OPL3, the always welcome YMF262. As for the 386, it came with... itself along with a USB power adapter and cable, and an I.O. board which breaks out PS2 keyboard and mouse and VGA. Rechargeable batteries were also included and already installed in the machines, and while they aren't immediately accessible, they're held together with Phillips head screws, making disassembly simple. Also, I gotta say, the size difference between the Book 8088 and the Hand 386 is way off from what I was expecting. The former is basically a netbook, but that 386 is surprisingly small and light, actually close in size to a floppy disk, at 128 by 150 by 16 millimeters and weighing just 307 grams, downright minuscule. To the point where my first impression is the hand 386 is almost unusably small. Guess we'll find out soon. For now, let's start with the Book 8088, effectively a Turbo XT PC in a clamshell case. So inside, it's running an NEC V20, clocked at either 4.77 or 8 MHz, swapping between speeds by pressing Function plus F6. It also boasts the always-enough 640K system RAM, along with 32KB CGA graphics, PC speaker output, and an AdLib compatible sound card. Although there is no volume control, despite these function keys, the only thing these do is mute, eliminating all sound from both the top panel speakers and headphone output on the side. The systems run on a 4000 mAh lithium-ion battery installed inside, but that only lasts a couple hours, so the 12V AC adapter is recommended. Its design falls in line with the trend of sub-notebook and palm-top PCs of the early to mid-90s, although its display and keyboard more bring to mind the netbooks of the late 2000s, and I imagine this was due to the availability of components. So you get a 7-inch color LCD panel at a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and a generic Windows keyboard with several keys that are useless on an MS-DOS PC. Although that .com button could actually have some use in DOS considering all those COM files, but it's disabled here, as with all other extraneous keys. 
And actually, the display's aspect ratio isn't so out of place, considering most portable computers in the 80s used wide panels too. So I wouldn't be bothered with it, except that even though it's stretching horizontally, it doesn't fill the whole screen vertically on an already wide display. Arguably even worse is the LCD's unfortunate combination of dimness, reflectivity, and narrow viewing angles. It's one of the worst displays I've seen, and I'm compensating a lot in camera and editing to make it look decent for the rest of this video. As for the keyboard, it's a perfectly decent feeling membrane thing with good key travel. No problem typing on once you're used to the shrunken keycaps, measuring a few millimeters smaller than full size. There is no mouse, not a big deal for DOS, but there's not even a place to plug one in, or practically anything else for that matter. It does have USB on the left-hand side, but that's used exclusively as a CH-375B USB storage interface. Now, this is something I've covered before over on LGR Blurbs, letting you use USB flash drives in DOS up to a certain capacity. A nice companion to the compact flash interface it uses as the primary hard disk, and is really hard to grab and remove here, so leaving it in place is preferred. The machine came with this 512 megabyte card, too, already filled with roughly 20 megs worth of operating system, software, and games of entirely dubious legality. On that note... Straight away here, I want to mention the BIOS, which you'll note is labeled Cycle Computer BIOS, copyright 2022 by Cycle Logic, and it's entirely bogus. In reality, this is the 8088 BIOS developed by Sergei Kisilev an open source project that could have been used legitimately, but the version included on this book 8088 has the copyright and GPL license removed, violating its open source terms. Reportedly, this has been changed for future machines, but still, the BIOS author being removed on mine leaves a bad taste, especially when giving credit costs nothing. On the other hand, these old copies of MS-DOS 6.22 and Windows 3.0 Eh, whatever, Microsoft will survive. As for what you can do on here, well, it's a Turbo XT class PC, so the usual stuff. I've covered lots of machines with similar specs already, and honestly, I think they're great. There's a restricted slowness to them that makes pushing their limits enjoyable, and examples of what it can do have been playing throughout this video. 8 MHz, 640K, CGA, and an OPL chip go a surprisingly long way. Again, though, that display really holds it back. It's such a dim, abysmal image, and the fact that it looks washed out from every angle, it just sucks. You don't even have controls for adjusting brightness or anything either, either physical or through software, according to the manual document provided to me through email. I reached out to the creator of the system about this, and he said I could take apart the LCD and change the R3 resistor to 7.5 ohm, not something I'm going to do immediately, but the option is better than nothing, I guess. Speaking of nothing, how about the 8088's lack of I.O., meaning no video out to bypass that LCD, but also no joysticks, no serial or parallel, and no keyboard connector. That being said, at least you have this, an external ISA bus expansion board. For me, this add-on took the system from being just, oh, that's kind of neat, to, ooh, I have to have it. Use a ribbon cable to connect to the PC, plug in the same 12-volt power supply that charges it, and enjoy a trio of 8-bit ISA slots. A good number of cards you could add to an original PC XT work great here, like sound cards, disc controllers, I.O. interfaces, and so on. Adding an 8-bit sound blaster is possible, too. Not that there's much to use it with, considering the 8088 plus CGA combination, but still, it's neat to try. Hello there. I'm a talking parrot. Welcome to the show. Go away! Of course, it already has a more suitable choice, that OPL3 card, which plops into the bay on the right, with three more sockets over on the left, housing the CPU and ripped-off BIOS. And that's also where an optional 8087 Math Copro would go, but I'm not doing that. 
Some folks state that it runs hot to the point of concern, possibly from being tightly packed in that plastic case. Otherwise, yeah, the system overall works well for what it is. The fact that it's using legit old chips for processor, DMA, timers, and controllers and stuff makes it amusing to watch do its thing. Like an HP 200LX that grew up, went off to college, and came back with a full-color display. I just wish I could see that display without waiting till daggum midnight. So, what about the HAND 386 then? Obviously, they took quite a different approach here, opting for something closer to a Nintendo 2DS, or that little pocket popcorn computer from a couple years back. It's a square-ish slab of silicon and synthetic materials with a satisfying soft feel to the fingertips. And its 5-inch display is thankfully much better compared to the one on the 8088, being more vibrant with wider viewing angles. Regrettably though, that's about where the positives end for me in terms of user experience. Now, while the display is better than the 8088's, its output is unavoidably soft and wide, like some of my best friends over the years. But unlike a friend, it's difficult to communicate with the HAND 386, and that's all down to its itty-bitty keyboard. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a good handheld QWERTY device. Many favorite phones over the years have had tremendous little keyboards, but this ain't one of them. For starters, there's a big difference between using a tiny keypad with software optimized for a phone and using a tiny keypad on a retro PC where nothing is optimized for it at all. Plus, every QWERTY portable device I've owned had somewhat tactile keys, but the HAND 386 it hits as mushy as overcooked peas, instilling zero confidence in your typing, not being useful for anything other than slowly pecking in commands. And there's still no integrated mouse either. Now, thank goodness this thing actually has some ports you can plug in. Being able to use a proper keyboard, mouse, and monitor is truly its saving grace, despite killing portability. For storage, there's a CF interface once again, packing a 2GIG card from the get-go, which boots up using an American Megatrends BIOS from the mid-90s and an operating system to match. Windows 95. For some reason. I don't know why it's not DOS 622. This is a poor choice for a 386. Especially this one. A DMNP M6117, which is a 40 MHz embedded 386SX with a 16-bit data bus, half that of a DX chip. These are typically found in industrial single-board computers, same as many other components that are in these PCs. It also has 8 MB of RAM, and chips and technologies F65535 graphics with a meg of video memory. Pretty good for a 386. But the rest of the build is simply too slow for 95. It's a confusing choice all around. Naturally, you can install whatever you like, or stick to pure DOS mode. And in DOS, things work just fine for a 40 MHz 386, albeit one without turbo, so games like Bubble Ghost or Test Drive 3 coded for a slower 386 will run too fast, unless using slowdown software, disabling cache, or what have you. And on the flip side of speed, games from 1993 and beyond mostly run like sludge. So it's best to choose games from that in-between sweet spot. The titles like Duke Nukem 2 and Wolfenstein 3D function well. There's ample speed for early 90s EGA and VGA gaming. Sad to say, the HAND 386 lacks Sound Blaster compatibility, though, so it's ad-lib and PC speaker only, and there's still no physical volume controls for the speakers or headphones. What the heck? You can at least add a Sound Blaster using another one of those $20 ISA bus extenders, but these aren't 16-bit slots, so using it also means being limited to 8-bit ISA capabilities. But yeah, it's the fact that you can do this at all that's so appealing, without needing a huge docking station as we often did with expandable portables in the 90s. And that's about it for these funky little AliExpress portable PCs. And boy, they sure are an odd mixture of skillful engineering, compromised hardware, and sketchy software being used. I'd find it difficult to recommend either one of them at $200, presuming they go up for sale again in the future. They're cool for a weekend of messing about, but beyond that, 
They seem more like a proof of concept for cramming legacy hardware into a small form factor rather than finalized products in and of themselves. Weirdly enough, the Book 8088 is the system that's more usable, so to speak, due to its keyboard and size, while also being less useful due to its slower speed, bad display, and lack of ports. And the Hand 386 has more potential for use, being the faster machine with more I.O., but as a portable, it's also the worse experience. If only the two were mashed together to create a 386 PC in a clamshell case with more ports, then you'd have something awesome. Or more accurately, you'd have something like the palm top PCs from the 90s. Such as the IBM PC 110, exactly the type of thing I'd rather use. It's sadly super rare and expensive though, so how about a Toshiba Libretto? Models like the 50CT can still be purchased for between $150 to $200, and not only do you get a nice keyboard and more I.O., but also a 75 MHz Pentium, 32 MB of RAM, and a 6-inch 4x3 LCD that looks great for its age. And clearly vintage machines aren't getting any younger, caps and displays are failing, batteries are kaput, and so on. But if your aim is to have a capable little DOS PC for 200 bucks, a 90s original is worth considering. Though I will admit, these AliExpress systems are fun to experiment with as a retro tech obsessed weirdo. I love the base concept here, repurposing old chips and creating something new with them. They really need more time in the oven to address the concessions and oversights, but they're still nifty little gizmos. Just make sure you know what to expect, or more importantly, what not to expect, because there's a lot of trade-offs here. And if you happen to have one of these, let me know your thoughts, or if you don't and have questions, leave them in the comments. Either way, there are always new LGR videos in the works, so I hope you stick around, and of course, thanks for watching.